Welcome, everyone. This is Mary Vanden Plas, Senior Manager of Research and Operations here at Birchworks. Today, two of our senior analytics recruiters, Sandy Marmot and Katie Ferguson, will share the results of our 2018 Predictive Analytics Salary Study. A few quick logistics items before we dive in. Only the presenters will be speaking, so your phones and microphones are muted. There will be a short Q&A at the end of the webinar. Uh, so I'll be collecting your questions via the chat function on the left side of your screen, where you can submit your questions for Sandy and Katie throughout the talk. If you experience any technical issues, submit those through the chat box as well. Finally, today's session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. So if you missed part of it or would like to share it with a colleague, you are welcome to do so. A quick introduction of our speakers today. Sandy Marmot, Birchworks partner and one of our executive recruiters, came to us from the world of human resources and has been recruiting in the quantitative marketing space for over 13 years. Sandy's area of expertise span from direct marketing to online marketing and web analytics to analytics management and predictive analytics. Sandy's webinar partner in crime today, Katie Ferguson, has over 10 years experience recruiting analytics professionals and specializes in early career roles and helped to launch Birchworks mid and junior level practice. Both Sandy and Katie have been actively involved in the analytics community, participating in groups like the American Statistical Association and Informs for years. And you may have also read some of their excellent insights on the Birchworks blog. In the past several years, Birchworks has been repeatedly mentioned in the popular press regarding analytics talent trends in publications such as the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, CNBC, Information Week, the Chicago Tribune, and Mashable. And this year was recognized by Forbes as one of America's best recruiting firms. And now over to you, Sandy and Katie. Thanks, Mary. Hello, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm excited to be presenting with my colleague, Sandy Marmot. We have worked together for over 10 years, but somehow have never presented together. We hope this is a helpful way to understand the highlights from this year's study. Since we published our first Birchworks study back in 2013, we have seen data-driven initiatives grow and analytics become a household word. I always joke that when I began recruiting in this industry, I had to explain to friends and family what I was recruiting for. Now everyone, including my grandma, knows, that, knows what predictive analytics is. So today, we'll be sharing the insights from our sixth annual salary study for predictive analytics professionals. Our study included 1,791 predictive analytics professionals. From here on out, Sandy and I will refer to them as PAPS for short. After the formal part of the presentation, we will have time for questions at the end, so be sure to send them in. On the agenda today, We'll talk a bit about how we identify PAPs. Then we'll cover salary changes and trends we're seeing. We'll also touch on a few other noteworthy findings this year. Then we'll give a quick recap on the data insights we found and follow up with an overview of the key analytics market trends we're seeing as well as their implications for professionals and employers. Lastly, we'll have a live Q&A at the end. Now I will turn it over to Sandy to discuss how we identify PAPs. Thanks, Katie. Hello, everyone. Glad you could join us today. As Katie mentioned, this is our first time presenting together. Katie and I have quite a history together at Birchworks. We were the first two recruiters that Linda Birch brought almost 10 years ago. So we've seen it all. But every day we continue to learn because there's always new stories. All right, enough about us. Back to defining a PAP. So because analytics is everywhere these days, there are lots of different definitions out there. To start with, it helps to have a strong idea of which professionals fall under our definition of PAPs and which ones do not. PAPs work with vast quantities of mostly structured data to answer business questions by developing models and then prescribe actions based on the data. Additionally, we can look at the edu educational backgrounds of PAPs 
they will have a strong quantitative background, usually in a discipline like statistics, math, or operations research. We also look at the tools these individuals use. And the most common choices are typically SAS, R, SQL, and Python. Other tools and technologies include Hive, Hadoop, Spark, and data visualization tools like Tableau or Power BI. Here is a snapshot from our most recent SAS, R, or Python flash survey a few months ago. Support for SAS stayed relatively steady, especially in the banking and pharmaceutical industries. As you can see also, Python is on the rise over the last three years. Sandy, let me jump in a second. I just want to make a note as I um, kind of work usually with students and professionals early in their career, I would say most students coming out of master's programs have no exposure to SAS. They are only learning R and Python. Yeah, that makes sense because now we're hearing from clients about R and Python proficiency more than ever. So this was not the case a few years ago, so it makes sense that you know, SAS is definitely on the decline. So I suggest learning R and Python if you're not using it right now. Okay. Here is who we are not including in our PATH definition. Marketing researchers, traditional MBAs, as these programs are not typically as quantitative, and web analytics, as these folks use different tools such as Excel, Omniture, or Google Analytics, and do not build advanced models. Business intelligence is another group, as these are more IT and reporting focused. So now more than ever, the lines tend to blur when talking about a PAP and a data scientist. Both PAPs and data scientists analyze data in order to glean insights and prescribe action for the organizations. PAPs tend to work with more structured data, while data scientists work with more unstructured or streaming data, like social media data, sensor data, or long blocks of text. Because of this, data scientists also have computer science and coding skills needed to wrangle messier data sets. Now Katie will discuss how we categorize predictive analytics professionals. Thanks, Sandy. I wanted to talk about how we categorize analytics professionals for this study. Once we have categorized someone as a PAP based on the criteria we just outlined, we classify them into one of six job categories. We'll refer to these throughout today's webinar, so I wanted to quickly review them. When we analyze our data, first we assign each professional to a job category as either an individual contributor, or as we abbreviate an IC, or a manager, or MG. And then we break these ICs and MGs into one of three levels. Individual contributors at level one are those typically in the first three years of their career. Level two professionals have approximately four to eight years of experience and are hands-on with data and are solving more advanced business questions. Level three professionals usually have over nine years of experience and likely to help train and mentor analysts. And usually at this point of their career are considered subject matter experts. For managers, we, ha we also have three levels dependent upon their primary function and the number of people they manage. So a level one manager is typically tactical and focused and may manage one to three reports, while a level two leads a function or is responsible for executing strategy and typically has four to nine direct reports. Managers at level three are the most senior leaders. They're at the executive level. They're responsible for determining strategy of the entire team, have P&L responsibility for their area of the business, and will likely have 10 or more direct reports. As you can see from the data we've collected, the largest 
portion of PAPs in our sample have 10 or, few, 10 or few year, fewer years of experience. As a recruiter, I see more and more candidates interested in studying analytics and also candidates from other areas of focus interested in transitioning into, predictive into the predictive analytics space. Kind of a funny story or a side note I wanted to mention. I was on the train this morning into work, and I was chatting with my friend um, who has a daughter that's currently submitting her college applications. And she was asking me advice on whether they should study stats. I kind of chuckled, and my answer was, of course. It's the wave of the future. There are, a few, there are a variety of industries that PAPs are employed under. As we've seen in the past, financial services and marketing and advertising firms continue to employ a large number of PAPs. Although we're also noticing increases across other industries as well. We'll touch on that later. And now, without further ado, Sandy will talk about salaries. Thanks, Katie. Okay, first let's start with the individual contributors. Here you can see the IC levels remain steady, much like last year's study. Here's the compensation trends we've been seeing over the last six years for ICs. Salaries have increased for all level, all IC levels since we started collecting data in 2013 but in recent years have been fairly steady. So next is the manager. Again, here is the data for this year compared to last year. Levels remain steady. Here's the compensation trends we've been seeing over the last six years for managers. Most increases were between 2013, 2014, and 2015, and then levels off the last three years. Now Katie will discuss some additional findings. There are a few additional findings that we wanted to pull out of this year's data, or that we pulled out of this year's data that we wanted to show you. As I mentioned earlier, financial services and marketing and advertising firms have always combined to account for more than 50% of PAP employers. This year, this number fell to 43%. I would say this is partly because use cases for analytics have been diversifying, but also advertising firms have had to change with, have had to change with so much advertising spend being directed at Facebook and Google ads. And we've seen many firms pull their marketing teams in-house rather than outsource to other firms. However, as the proportion of analytics professionals employed by advertising and marketing firms has declined, we've seen industries like tech and other fields increase. Our data has shown that on the coast, PAPs earn higher base salaries than those in other regions. However, the higher salary earned may not make up for the higher cost of living seen in these areas, and the disparity between regions has been narrowing. You know, Katie, what I find interesting is that when I have a candidate that's thinking of moving to either one of the coasts, they do those cost of living calculators, and they expect the employers to make up the difference in the cost of living, and often the employers do not feel responsible to make up the difference. So it's kind of a slippery slope. For sure, Sandy. I, I would totally agree and, and echo that statement. Um, salaries by industry also vary. Here you can see the example for our Level 3 individual contributors. These are just a few of the industries we track. I do want to note that different companies have different salary structures, and some may rely more on a bonus rather than a base salary. So here's what we've covered so far. We're seeing very little shifting in the base salaries by level compared to years past. 
we've noticed the largest increase or shift this, this past year for mid-level leaders, albeit small. For the most part, the coasts have the highest paid PAPs, and we've continued to observe a small difference in compensation based on industry. 55% of our study have 10 or less years of experience, and 43% are employed in either financial services or in advertising and marketing firms. If you're interested in learning more, there's additional data available in our full report, so be sure to download it. It just went up on our website today, and it has a breakdown on compensation and demographic information. Now I'm going to pass things back to Sandy to share some overall trends she's noticing from this year's study and the meaning behind it. Okay, uh, let's go over some of the trends we're picking up on and what it means for the candidate and the employer. We are seeing an increase in supply at the early career level. We first pointed this out a few years ago but recently the difference has become much more noticeable. We have seen the educational backgrounds of PAPs increasingly diversify, meaning now there are more paths into the analytics field, such as new advanced degree programs, or experienced candidates adding skills with boot camps, or more candidates making a transition from other fields into analytics. Oh, Sandy, let me jump in and kind of add a little note here. Um, Michael Rappa, I know some of you guys know him over at NC State. He, runs, he heads up that program. He recently noted in his latest study that there are about 140, I believe that's the number, new programs out there for analytics. Well, there you have it, more programs. Uh, okay, so implications for PAPS with more educational programs and other avenues to learn new skills and tools, it's crucial to keep your skill set diversified and up to date. For employers, be ready to train these early career folks up on the business side of the workplace since they are newer to the business acumen side of things early on. So they won't have those skills going in. Now what I find very interesting is Despite the intense competition for talent, there has not been a significant increase in salary bands at any job level. However, we have noticed in our conversations with clients looking to hire an increase in the perks that are popping up. So perks like flexible work schedules, work from home, providing daily lunch, or having a fully stocked kitchen, which we do, and that works out nicely. Also, I've seen offerings with health and fitness benefits. Now, it will be interesting to see if this perks trend continues. Now, for professionals, keep in mind salary is an important consideration, but it's also crucial to look for growth and learning opportunities. Also, pay attention to some of these perks they can make a difference in your day-to-day -day life. Now employers, think about benefits that you haven't traditionally offered in the past, but might make sense in this competitive market. Our sense is something has to give with all this upward pressure for higher salaries. So be ready, employers. Now the increase in analytic opportunities is leading candidates to become much more picky. <laughs> We've noticed that because analytics professionals have so many options, they're shying away from roles that require long hours and difficult commutes. There has also been an increased resistance to moving to a new city, especially with candidates with families, or working in cities that aren't considered tech forward. Now for professionals, there has never been a better time to be an analytics professional. However, watch out for changing jobs too frequently or being overly focused on salaries. These are always red flags for our employers when they are looking at resumes. Now employers, the market is strong, which means it's crucial for employers to pay attention to their image. 
the quantitative community is still small, so be cognizant of your reputation and what is being said on social media. Also, make sure candidates have a good experience in the interview process. This is very important when competing for talent. A good interview can speak volumes. Also, there were two other emerging trends we wanted to mention here before we get to the Q&A. Laws preventing employers from asking potential candidates about their salary history are spreading to more and more places. There is a reason these laws came into place. They are there to make sure to basically level the playing field for all incoming salaries across the board. As you might figure, this can present challenges for our salary data collection. But it can also add complications for analytics professionals in the hiring process. Without salary disclosure, I have seen there's often additional back and forth that can lengthen the hiring process, which makes things difficult for both sides. Another trend that is obstructing both employers and many analytic professionals is the current tangle around visa support in the U.S. Many visa candidates are seeing increased wait times from premium processing holds and additional requests for evidence. We have also seen transfer declines when in the past these transfers were seamless. These issues are very troubling for those on both sides of the hiring table. All right, I think that's enough from us for now. Back to you, Mary. Thank you for digging into that fascinating analysis, Sandy and Katie. As we mentioned earlier, if you're looking for more information, be sure to go to our website, www.birchworks.com study to download our entire report. It's free to download and is available now. And now for some additional information about Birchworks and all the resources that we offer to both our clients and professionals. So for those of you who aren't that familiar with Birchworks, we're an executive recruiting firm specializing in quantitative fields like analytics, data science, and marketing research. We're the leading resource for insights about the hiring market and produce three comprehensive salary study reports every year for our main specialty areas. These reports each contain 30 plus pages of data and can be downloaded for free at birchworks.com study. If you're looking to add to your predictive analytics staff, we'd be happy to speak with you and do some brainstorming about what you might have planned in terms of hiring before the end of the year. We offer contingency and retained services from entry level analysts all the way up to chief analytics officer searches. Feel free to send us an email if you want to chat. Info at birchworks.com. If you're looking to browse for new opportunities, you can check out our targeted job board, which is trafficked by thousands of quantitative professionals in a variety of fields. For more hiring market insights, check out our birchworks.com slash blog, where you can find slash surveys on SAS, R, and Python preferences, what motivates analytics professionals to change jobs, as well as advice on resumes, interviews, evaluating job offers, and much more. You can also follow Birchworks across our social media channels to stay up to date on our latest research. Our YouTube channel, found at youtube.com slash birchworks, you can find recordings of our other presentations, including SAS R or Python data analysis from an actual data scientist, and predictions for the data science and analytics market as well as our series with Executive Leadership Coach Tim Rathmeyer with topics including the impact of confidence on career success, making career goals, improving collaboration skills, and making successful career transitions. And now is the time everyone has been looking forward to, the Q&A. So let's jump in and feel free to continue sending your questions in using the chat box on your screen. So Sandy and Katie, we've got some good questions for you today. Um, first up, uh, there's been a couple people asking about making lateral moves in their career and whether it's smart in terms of salary or you know, what your advice is there. All right. Well, we can both weigh in on this. Um, lateral moves are 
good because it's really not always about the money, and there's good reasons to go lateral. Uh, first of all, you'll get different experiences. You can get your foot in the door in new companies, and you can learn new skill sets. I, I recently had a colleague, or um, a candidate actually, that wanted to get into a firm, and he actually made a lot more and was quite happy with um, a little less than lateral. That doesn't happen often, but I really admired him for making that move. And I can piggyback off on that a little, piggyback on that a little bit. I've had a few candidates that I placed that went into different industries um, that made a lateral move. And what it was, I felt like, was it was a sidestep for a really nice career path. And um, that way they came in, they were able to learn, they didn't have pressure of being at this higher level, they learned the business, and then they were able to grow from there. Um, so I think that made it from a professional and a personal standpoint a little bit easier for them. So certainly you know, it's dependent on on you know a case by case basis, but you have to you know it has to work for you. Uh, thank you for that um, answer. Next up, um, we have been hearing you know you you talked a bit about visas in the presentation, and we've gotten a few questions about visa transfer timing in the marketplace. How long is it taking? Oh, yikes! Yes. Um, we have um, certainly heard kind of some scary stories about how long the visa transfers are taking. A um, couple of just you know examples here. We we recently placed someone here at Birchworks that is on a visa. Um, the offer went out a few weeks ago and was accepted, and the immigration attorneys and the companies are telling us it's going to take four to six months to transfer. Um, so we're looking at a February or March of 2019 start date. Um, and this is because there is um, a hold on premium processing. Um, we've also heard, Sandy, yeah. did you hear somebody? Yeah, I did. So a lot of times employers encourage candidates to transfer just based on the receipt before the transfer is, is fully accepted. So uh, I have heard a story of a candidate that did that, and then it came down to his you know, visa paperwork going through, but there was requests for evidence, and uh, there were some problems getting it approved. So you know, a lot of times employers want these candidates to go on the receipt, but you know, we could have some sort of issue with uh, running into problems on the transfer side. So it, it's, it's a tough thing right now. All right. It looks like we have time to just squeeze in one last question here. Um, so about negotiating job offers, um, is it okay, and what should you keep in mind? Okay. Well, this is an interesting what I call dance. Uh, things can get tricky. It, it is good to negotiate. I mean, this is the time when you first go in where you can really prove your case. It's, it's hard once you start to then negotiate. So. It is the time. However, um, you have to make sure that you do it in the right way because if you become overly demanding or don't approach it well, um, it's, your reputation follows you. So the negotiating process is really your first takeaway from that employer of how you're going to be as an employee. So um, you know, it's, it's a good time to do the negotiation, but just be careful with the way you ask because it sometimes can be viewed negatively. I mean, to kind of jump in again, I just feel like just don't over negotiate. You know, you can it just can put a bad taste in um, the company's mouth. Just know what you you know think you can negotiate on, or you know, talk with us. We're happy to help. Um, and just make sure that you know you're you don't want to over negotiate when you know you're going to take the job offer whether they do it or not. So just just be careful. Again, it's 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 a little bit of a dance. It's a little bit like dating. Just <laughs> make sure you're you know you're you're thinking about all all yeah. people involved. Right. Don't don't have a target on your back after the negotiations. This was the person that asked for that. Uh, so it it is it's a good time to do it, but be careful. That's our our sense. 
All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you to everyone who submitted questions. And that's the, the time we have for today. But don't forget to visit www.birchworks.com slash study to download our full report. And if you want to connect further with us, our email address is info at birchworks.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us today.